Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Stephanie Jabauer, and today we get to hear from Pastor Sam and Olivia Pitch. The Pitch family joins us as part of an ongoing segment called Friends in Real Life, where I sit down to talk with a friend, in this case, two friends, about a real life issue as they experience God's mercy and His grace in real time. Listeners, we want to give a preview of some sound bites that can again be heard at the end of this episode in their original context, uh, hopefully to help frame the telling of the Pitch's family story and for something to keep in mind as you listen. I know that they have a God who made them and, and loves them. And so when we think about our special needs folks in our congregations and our communities, we need to be very careful about how we regard them. We want to regard them as Christ regards them and not as less than, not as burdens. After the initial shock of an autism diagnosis wears away, like Olivia said, these are your children and these are the children that God gave you. This might sound a little bit selfish, but I think there's some truth to it is my children have made me a better person. They've taught me to love more unconditionally as God loves us. You can think about it in the terms of vocation, because I think a lot of people might ask the question, why? Why me? Well, maybe there's very good reason. Maybe this is what God has entrusted to you, and it's, it's an honor. And so I, I think I want the church to know, view, view people, all people, the way that God views them. Sam and Olivia, welcome. Would you please introduce yourselves? Hey, Stephanie, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Sam Pitch. I serve as a pastor in Moorhead, Minnesota, uh, right across the border from Fargo, North Dakota. And uh, I am Olivia. Olivia Pitch, <laughs> Sam's wife of just now four years. We have three beautiful children. We have our twins, Leland and Frederick, that just turned three in November, and then a newly born baby, Peter, who is uh, close to five months. So we've been in the Moorhead area for about a year and a half. Prior to that, we lived and I served in the Omaha, Nebraska area, uh, Gretna, Nebraska. The reason I think you brought us on today, and uh, and maybe I maybe I should let you introduce the topic. Um, Although I'm a pastor, I'm really here, or we're really here today because we're parents of uh, special needs children. Our twins, Leland and Frederick, were diagnosed with autism, and uh, I know that's the topic of today's conversation. Is raising children with special needs, and happy to talk with you about that today. Thank you both for joining me and for being willing to talk about this. And and you're right, Sam, I do have you both on primarily to learn from you. I have a lot to learn, and I think our listeners do too. And then I also hope that some listeners who might have gone through some similar experiences or are going through something similar would be encouraged and and also know that they're not alone. Leland and Frederick and then Peter. Those are some really strong boy names. <laughs> Real strong. Yeah, they're a little old fashioned, but they're, they're family names. Uh, Leland was my grandfather's name. A few people might actually recognize that name. He was a Lutheran school teacher for 40 some years in Missouri and Kansas. And uh, he's a very special guy to me. He passed away a couple of years ago. And, and Frederick is a family name as well. It's my grandmother's father's name. And then uh, the new one, Peter, it's also a family name and just a name we liked. Mm-hmm. You know, it just, uh, they are strong names though. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of kinda old fashioned. I like that. I like old fashions. So Sam and Olivia, we were talking before how our daughter and your boys are a a day apart in age. So our three-year-old girl, of course, is pretty much on track with your boys in, in age. And there is a lot that I've learned about our three-year-old in this time, but a lot that I still have to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm curious, can you just start from the beginning and since your boys are three and and only three when were they diagnosed and and how did you did you notice anything first or did doctors guess start from the beginning yeah so um from the beginning i mean having twins was just 
uh, you know, just a lot of work and a, a blur, but from everything from birth to about 18 months, the boys were completely on track with, you know, all those milestones that you track, babbling at the right time, rolling over at the right time, responding to their name when called. So, you know, we didn't really think anything of it, of anything being kind of off. And then I believe right around 18 months when we went in for our checkup, I think our doctor kind of noticed a few things. Like when she was asking us, you know, those, those certain questions and um, she had suggested that we go in to see a specialist. And, you know, at that point, I think Sam and I were, you know, looking at each other, like we didn't even know this was kind of something to be looking for. Like we just didn't pick up on it. Cause I mean, they were our first two children. So um, we were pretty new at, at all of it. Um, and I think I'm, I'm naturally an anxious person. I'm a worrier and I was at home with the boys all day. So I think that, you know, her suggestion started me thinking and really, really looking at like the, those questions she asked us, you know, like, um, are they interacting with each other? Are they, you know, I can be asking us for things. Yes. Is a big part. The communication part. Hmm. Which, so, and you know, in the first, we kind of were like, well, there's, tw- they're twins. There's two of them. So like we might be missing something while one is doing one thing and the other is doing the other, or, you know, they have that twin language that everyone talks about. So we're like, maybe that's what it is. And then I just, I think I just started to get really worried and anxious about it. And I did a lot of research about, okay, what could this be? And, you know, with those questions and I guess those little boxes, the doctor checks off, I I looked into that and a lot of things pointed to autism. I think at first I kind of really like almost shut down about it and almost kind of panic attack. You get kind of like shaking, couldn't sleep at night, but that's because I don't think I really knew what autism was. I don't think I was ever educated on it. Didn't know any autistic people or you know, I could I could know some autistic people, but sometimes it doesn't really show or you don't know what you're looking for. But learning more about it, and I guess with it being in our lives right now, it's it's totally just normal. And I don't know. It's so hard. Like, you don't really worry about it anymore because you're kind of in this, what people I think tend to call like an autism bubble. Just going back to when <clears throat> the signs that we saw, you know, Olivia said it, very normal development uh, physically in terms of communication, but it just they just sort of hit some sort of glass wall when it yeah. came to development. And I think we noticed that a lot because the boys have a cousin, Olivia's sister's daughter, who is just a month or so older. And, you know, the first couple of times we'd go to, you know, to family reunions or whatever it might be, holidays, you know, they seem to be kind of on the same track. But it, it became pretty clear that the boys had fallen pretty far behind in terms of communication and, and socialization. And, uh, you know, um, I think the first, the, the, the main thing they say about autism and recognizing it in young kids is early intervention is the best thing you can do. You can kind of be in denial about it and you can kind of take a wait and see approach. But the, the, the key is, you know, while, while the children are still very young and their, their, their brains are in this stage of high development that's that's the time to start working on some of these social and communication skills um right you know like every like every two-year-old three-year-old four-year-old is soaking up everything that's true for an autistic kid as well and so that was that was a big part of it you know uh if 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 this was going to be uh, a reality for them that they're going to be diagnosed with autism let's 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 be aggressive let's let's go find out right and yeah, I'm really appreciative of, you know, our pediatrician and my mother actually worked with younger children. And she, you know, I came to her and I was like, hey, the doctor said this and I don't know how I feel about that. And she's like, well, you know, she kind of pushed us to look into it and just make the appointment, you know, and just be like, whatever outcome happens, you know, there's still you walk in to the appointment with the same children you walk out with. They're the same. You know, it's mm-hmm. just 
what do they need? What what kind of support are your kids going to need? I have a couple questions backing up because I'm just thinking of 18 months old. And as far as my kids, like sometimes they're not even wa- walking yet right. at 18 months. Mm-hmm. So how could you, I'm just wondering, how could you possibly pick up on like, are they interacting appropriately together? Or those kind of questions where are they communicating their needs? It's like, uh, <laughs> I don't remember exactly how my kids were at that age, but they were both kind of, you know, late to use words and kind of grunted for what they needed. So I just those questions alone, I don't know that those would have ever hit on my radar. And I'm suspecting what you're talking about with the pediatrician is you know, at a, at a certain age in infancy and then through toddlerhood and in early childhood, they always have those milestone marker check boxes that parents always have to fill out in the pediatrician's office. As you were filling that out, did you, did you have any like sinking feelings of, oh, they don't do this, they're supposed to do this? Or was it not until your pediatrician address them with you that that you started getting concerned i think we had concerns before the pediatrician noticed it It, it's it's a little bit hard to articulate i think the best way to think about it is (laughs) like the word uh, autism you know comes from this greek root autos which means self and and that's what you kind of notice about them is and this is still the case for them they are very i don't say withdrawn but internal yeah they they really uh they can do their own thing. They're very independent. Uh, they love a little project that's right in front of them. And I think that's probably the, the first big thing we noticed is they weren't so interested in each other. And, and, as, so and as twins, you would expect them to be very interested in each other. Just very, They would get very hyper-focused on the toy they were playing with or something, a book that they were looking at. And frankly, they weren't that interested in us. Mm-hmm. You know, They were very much in their own world. And, and that's sort of like the, the, you know, again, that's what the word autism means and people are finding out and doing all sorts of research in autism. They're finding a really beautiful side to autism as well, but that's kind of, I think the first thing we noticed, um, it wasn't just that they weren't saying words. It wasn't just, you know, some of those measurable things. It was their disposition towards uh, other people and their disposition towards the world that they lived in. You know, they loved the area right around them and, and what was right in front of them. And it didn't show a lot of interest in, in anything else. I think, you know, responding to your question about those boxes getting checked off at the pediatrician's office, I think, you know, Sam referenced our niece who's about, I think, two weeks older than the boys and um, it's one thing seeing it and you're like, okay, well, the boys are so close to that, you know, like she's walking and they're going to be walking so soon. And they did, they walked right on time. Um, and you, you kind of give yourself these excuses. You're like, well, they were born at 36 weeks and not 40. So, you know, they were premature and you just take all that in. But at the pediatrician's office, seeing it on paper, like actually having to tick those boxes, you're like, oh. There is something, you know, and it, it really settled on my heart. Like it was hard to just see that there, there could be something off at that point in their life. They start calling it uh, like a developmental delay and you, you know, you start thinking, okay, well, what am I doing wrong? How do I help my children? Or at least I do. I'm not a good mother. I'm not helping my kids meet these certain things. So, you know, and and then you start realizing like, oh, life isn't looking like, you know, the normal life that everyone else has it for an 18 month year old. Like, mm-hmm. okay, so what is that? How is that a little bit different? And it's not, for me, it's not what I was super expecting, you know, like always wanted to have kids and I was like, oh, these are the things that we'll get to do together. And it's just life looks different. I can identify a lot with you in those feelings of being a mom. What am I what am I doing wrong? How am I deficient? How am mm-hmm. I not helping my children, you know, and succeed at these at these milestones that they're supposed to? Mm-hmm. 
what was your what was your worst fear before going into your first you know specialist appointment you had said you you felt panicky and you had a hard time sleeping what was that do you think um i think for me it was just the unknown like i didn't like before i said i, I wasn't sure what autism really was i never like had to look into it, you know, it was just kind of in the back of my thing that some people are autistic and, you know, like, I think we've come a long way in our culture with people making jokes about it or are thinking it's one thing and it not being, you know, whatever it is. But I think by the time we got to our specialist appointment, I knew and I'd made my peace with that just because it's Leland and Frederick. Like, I, I love my kids to death. They're beautiful. Everything they do is just, I mean, they have so much fun and they're, they're really enjoying life. They're happy boys. And um, they just, they weren't any different to me at all. Whether it be, you know, their diagnosis was, they're totally just, you know, a little bit delayed or, you know, they have high functioning autism to, you know, severe autism. So what's the likelihood of twins receiving the same diagnosis? Mm -hmm. I mean, are there statistics ab about that or are they because they're twins, their genetics are so similar? It's an interesting thing because no one really knows what the cause of autism is. It's, it's really interesting. For something as prevalent as autism, they have no idea what causes it. Is it genetic factors? Is it in my en environmental factors? You know, is it something in utero? You know, they don't, they don't know. And so it, it is interesting, identical twins, and they are identical, having the same, same diagnosis and being very, uh, in very similar places on the spectrum. I don't know what the statistics, what the statistics are necessarily, but you know, it's, it's definitely a sign that there, there is something, there's obviously, obviously a large genetic factor uh -huh. in autism. You know, autism is it's probably more common than people think it, it is a spectrum. It doesn't look the same in everyone. You know, some people are very severely autistic and, you know, they live their life, uh, you know, they never, you know, nonverbal and it takes a lot of support. And a lot of people are very high functioning in their autism and they, never they get married, they have kids, they have careers and, and, you know, maybe they're just a little socially awkward or, or, or struggle to pick up on some social cues. But, I think the fact that we have identical twins with autism, it's, I don't know how rare it is, but it is interesting. Define what autism is and then what the spectrum could mean. Yeah, sure. Autism is characterized as a developmental disability, and it takes on a lot of different forms. Uh, the disability is primarily focused on a couple areas, communication is probably the biggest one, uh, along with socialization. So it's not necessarily an intellectual disability. In fact, a lot of autistic people are extremely smart, extremely high IQ, but it really is about how you interact with other people. So it is a spectrum and it manifests differently in different people. In fact, like boys and girls, it manifests very differently. It's very rare actually to to diagnose a young girl, like a two or three year old girl with autism, it tends to manifest differently. And a lot of uh, females who get diagnosed, get diagnosed in like their teens and twenties, boys are, it's a little bit more obvious, but it's a spectrum. There are some people, like I said earlier, who have really, really severe. What's the best way to put it? <laughs> I don't, I, I, you have to be sort of careful in the way you talk about it, but yeah. Who have very profound sort of manifestations of their autism, who, who maybe never learn to speak, who never develop fine motor skills, who need a lot of care and attention, maybe never toilet train, you know, it can be very, very severe. And then there's this whole huge spectrum. And on the other end, you, you might even find sort of an autistic savant, someone who, who has sort of a genius level intellect in their manifestation of autism where they're really focused on one or two particular subjects can lead them to be sort of leaders in fields of music or science. People talk about like Einstein as perhaps 
almost definitely being autistic or someone like Mozart, people who maybe struggled a little bit socially, uh, but because of their almost superhuman ability to focus in on a couple of narrow subjects became, you know, geniuses and innovators. So there, it's, it's a very, very wide spectrum. Some people, they're just a little bit socially awkward. Um, a lot of people who go into the sciences, a lot of engineers, a lot of mathematicians tend to be on that spectrum. It's just, it, it's a very, very broad spectrum. And yeah, I know they, I mean, it can range from someone just being like a little quirky to, you know, how severe Sam said. And I, I look at it too, like when I was first researching it is you have the neurotypical and then people with autism are neuro, neurodivergent. Uh, or atypical. Or atypical, so right. What does that mean? Well, so neurotypical is just how a typical brain processes, processes things. Yes. Through, yeah. And neurodivergent brain just, just works differently. And I, I remember my oldest niece finding out the news. And she was around, I guess, six at the time. And she's just like, I heard about the boys. And she she was trying to like understand and explain it. And she's like, what does that mean? And I was like, well, Penelope is just, Leland and Frederick's brain works a little bit different than ours do. You know, they might really be into one certain thing and be really, really focused on that. And that's okay. It's just a learning curve of just like, oh, you're, it's not you're different. It's just your brain works different and you like different things or you, you do things a different way. That is kind of the simplest way that people talk about an autistic brain. It's, it's wired differently, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes that, that causes you to struggle in some areas, but there's also a certain giftedness that comes yeah. with a, a lot of people who are autistic. They're Be the, very beautiful, artistic, mathematical, scientific, you know, musical. There, there's, there's a certain giftedness that comes with having a brain that isn't, isn't exactly uh, typical, mm -hmm. uh, and what I love the saying that I hear a lot is if you know one person with autism, you know, one person with autism, kind of meaning no one with autism looks the same. Everything, you know, it can. All Except dark twins. <laughs> Not necessarily. I feel like Leland and Frederick are, they like different things. I mean, they are very similar. They're twins. You know, they're three-year-old twins. It, yes. It's just. And that's why they really focus on it being a spectrum. Hmm. Where do your boys fall on the, on the spectrum right now? And will that, will that change perhaps? Does, is that a fluid thing or? You no, know, Steph, I wonder that too. And the boys are so young. They don't really tell you. Uh -uh. And, and they don't really score. You know, that, that spectrum is a very fluid thing. As far as I know, they don't give you like a score. You're not like zero to 100 and, you know. You're, the boys are a 43 or something like that. They kind of talk about levels of severity across certain, you know, parameters, communication, motor. socialization, motor skills, that sort of thing. But that's a, that's a question I wonder a lot. It's really hard to project what sort of skills they're going to acquire, what level of communication they're going to be able to attain. I think about that a lot. You know, are they going to be able to grow up and have romantic relationships what kind of career would they be able to have and you know they're three and it's no one's mm -hmm. gonna project anything for you yeah. you know and i don't mm -hmm. know if that's just sort of policy <laughs> in the therapy community or if, if that's just they they don't know that 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 all kids and and especially autistic kids they develop at their own rate you know there's there's fits and starts you know there's there's growth spurts and there's delays and the regression or yeah, there's progress and there's regression. And I think for a while with Leland and Frederick, let's see, they really started like their therapy back in September. I think before that, I would classify them. I mean, they would be classified as nonverbal. I think now they're probably technically preverbal, meaning they, they went from having no words, no, no kind of ways of communicating or telling us what they need to now that they'll say words. Not necessarily if we're like, if Leland's playing with a toy and I'll say, hey, Leland, what's this? Um, he doesn't respond to me, but if he's playing by himself, maybe he's running around saying baby shark, baby shark, or octopus or train or any of those things. Um, so with speech, we're definitely getting there. Their communication skills 
or getting at, at kind of nothing to now they will take salmonized hands. Like if Freddie is really ready to go to school, he will take dad's hand and take him to the garage door because he knows, you know, our truck is out there. We're going to school today. Or if Leland's hungry, he he will take my hand and take me to the pantry and we'll, we'll search for something for a snack. And for like kind of fine motor skills, these boys are like incredibly strong. Their balance is insane. They're climbers. <laughs> They're climbers. Um, oh boy. <laughs> yes, but the, like... I think they they really trust their bodies and they're really good with that. But I think the fine motor skills, like we we don't eat with forks yet. Um, it's all finger foods. And I think those are things in school and in therapy they work on. And I know right now they're working on using a pencil or just holding things or, or sorting or stacking um, is something they're working on. So that's kind of where they're at right now. But I mean, from a year ago, it's been an incredible journey. It's so exciting for Sam and I to see all that they've been able to accomplish. So I, I think we're super proud. And I don't know, I mean, with kids who are neuro neurodivergent, them saying like their first words at three is just like, even I think, I, don't, I can't speak for anybody else, but it's, it's extra exciting that they're starting to use daddy yeah, at the same time, they're they're also very intelligent in in some ways that are kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, they uh, knew all of their letters at a, at a pretty early age. Mm -hmm. Can count to. They can count to who knows hundreds. Hundreds. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Leland, wow. Knows, yeah, they're they're just they they take a lot in. That oh, that's the gosh, thing you yeah. notice about them is they are studiers. They love to sit down with a book. They love to sit down with flashcards or you know a puzzle or something like that and they're taking a lot in they don't necessarily communicate as much out but when they do have those little brief moments where they're able to communicate you can kind of see that they've they've soaked a lot up they uh <laughs> and, and they love learning it's uh -huh. it's it's kind of interesting just their their brains are working uh they're definitely working they're just working a little differently than the yeah. typical brain and their brain is i feel like it's always working and they you know kids they say or are, are just people in general with autism have a hard time with sleep and that's just because their brains are always going and it's hard to shut your brain down and i feel like i i feel like i experience that too it's hard for me to go to sleep sometimes you know when you just can't shut your brain off you can just be like all right stop thinking go to sleep so that is one struggle we do have is we're pretty sleep deprived in our house. <laughs> Not to mention with a, a five month old too. Right. right. Yeah. But it's our new norm. You mentioned the really beautiful sides of people with autism. What have you noticed so far with your boys? Is it what you just said, Sam, the, the fact that they zone in so well and are absorbing all this incredible information that I, I, my <laughs> my daughter does not know planets <laughs> or can count past 12. <laughs> what do you see in your boys that is really profoundly beautiful, even at an early age? You know, it's, it's interesting. Like, because they're not the most social kids, you, you kind of wonder, are they affectionate? Are they loving? And that's one, I think that's probably been their, their largest area of growth yeah. Even more than communication and stuff is, you know, that, that was hard for a while as they weren't big huggers or kissers, you know, they, but they've really sort of bonded, I think, especially with mom, but even to an extent with myself. And that's been really nice. Uh, you know, that, that is sort of a hallmark of autistic people is, is maybe they struggle to form those interpersonal connections and have those sort of relationships that a neurotypical person would, but the boys have grown a lot in the area of, of just affection. Oh yeah. So that's been really fun. They're big snugglers. And every time they see dad, they want to give him a hug. It's so sweet. The beauty of it. They're, they're pretty kind to each other. And now that there's a baby in the house, <laughs> baby brother, and, and they're not super interested in each other, but oh. they're not, uh, un unsympathetic. It, it comes in these brief, quiet little moments. Mm -hmm. They they share a bedroom and uh, they have their own bed. 
a lot of nights you go in, you find them it's in the same bed, <laughs> cuddled together, <laughs> and they don't talk to each other. They don't play with each other so much, but they still like being around each other. They're always in the same room together. <laughs> they like to sort of take up the same space together. So that's kind of fun. That's kind of nice. They love roughhousing. <laughs> like that, that, that's kind of the interesting thing with them is we're talking about them as, you know, autistic toddlers, but they're, they're also very much just toddlers. Yeah. And so some of the things that just normal toddlers would enjoy the roughhousing and the getting thrown up in the air and spun around <laughs> in circles, going to the playground and uh, they can really, they can really tear up a playground. They, uh, they love <laughs> the jungle gym and the swings and stuff. Like it's really a joy to see them. That's where I feel most connected with them is, mm-hmm. is when we're, we're playing when we're roughhousing. That's when they make the best eye contact. That's when they kind of ask you for things the most. And, you know, that's, that's a place where I find a lot of joy with them is just playing with them. I can't play with them in the way that maybe I'd envisioned. I think you have kids and you envision a certain level of communication. You want to be able to teach your kids things. And that's probably the hardest part about it for me is I feel like I can't teach them the things I want to teach them, but I can interact with them in, in some ways and, and play is, is probably the way I feel most bonded to them. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. How has this impacted your life as a parent, your expectations, um, now your reality? And Sam, you, you kind of answered that as a father. Olivia, how has this impacted you so far as a mother to two little boys with autism? Um, I think it's, you know, it's just allowed me to look at the world a little bit differently. And I feel like for our family, we have just this, such this beautiful world. And I, I have, or I've heard other people call it like kind of when you're at home, you're in your like autism palace or your autism bubble where like everything's just totally normal. And your kids are playing the way they play and, you know, you give them the foods they like and all those things are normal. But when you go out into the world, when you step away or out of your autism palace, everything looks different. It's a little bit harder to go out to eat, you know, after church on Sundays or you really got to figure out who's going to be the right person to come and babysit the kids when mom and dad want to go out on a date. We still have to have things pretty, you know, locked up tight. They're really excited about getting, (laughs) trying to get in the oven or climbing on top of the kitchen sink, which I mean, safety is always important and they're just three. But, and I know there's a big debate about when you're describing someone, if you say, you know, this is my son, Frederick, he is autistic versus this is my son, Frederick. He has autism. I think lately I've been describing them as just having autism because I want that to be just like, it's just one characteristic of what makes them up. Otherwise, they're normal three-year-olds. You know, they love shapes and colors and they love to roughhouse with dad and they eat chicken nuggets and they like to go <laughs> on the playground and you know hold your hand when you're walking the world is different i don't think our family is super different it's just we have to adjust in certain ways you know like i think my family eventually like my parents and my sisters and all that stuff we want to go on a beach vacation for the family and i think that's lovely but with kids with some sensory issues you know we have to think of like they're not going to like walking in the sand. They're not good. You know, and you think, okay, um, how are we going to deal with like a pool or the ocean? You have to be, I think, a lot more careful and you have to kind of really plan ahead of what, what is going to overload your kid and what kind of experiences and things you, you know, don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not making a lot of sense right now. Do you know what I'm saying? I think you're making a lot of sense. What I'm hearing you say is that you're, Life at home is routine for you. So Mm -hmm. that is your normal. But when the sense of having children with differences is heightened is when you go into the, into public, when you make special accommodations that you might not otherwise out of concern or care for them. And then I guess how I thought you were going to end that, maybe I'm wrong, is that 
to still give them experiences, but what experiences are going to maybe cause harm or stress in their life versus what experiences are new to them that they should experience because they ha- they're in the safety of your care. Well, right. I, w- I would imagine it's a balance of <laughs> how hard do we push them, right? but they still need to experience different things. Mm-hmm. And every parent goes through that, but you to a much larger extent, or it seems to be augmented. Right. Is that correct? Was that what you would have yeah. said or am I? No, great. I think that's very well said. I think that's a tension for us, especially for kids who just face delays, you know, uh, even regressions is how much do you push them? You know, we're always trying to get our kids to learn new things and expand their horizons. But with our kids, we have to, we have to sort of modify our expectations and, and, and think about how they view the world. And we don't want to overload them, stress them out because, um, yeah, it's, it, it is a challenge. Um, how comfort, you know, you find the things that work, sort of the comfort zone, and it, it takes some courage and consideration to, to step out of that because mm-hmm. there can be consequences. And you just, you just want to do right by your child. Routine is so good for us and for the boys to be regulated. And when we take them out of it, you know, I don't want it to be hard on them. And I guess maybe that's because I'm just an anxious worrier kind of person. But I don't, yeah, I don't want to push them too far, you know, but I think anybody, any parent feels that way with their kid, you know, it's just, you're right. It might be just a different degree or a different perspective of it. What does your routine look like right now? And did, by you saying you started therapy in September, was this last September or the previous one? How long have the boys been in therapy? Uh, September, 2021. So this past September. Okay. Um, so, but even before they were three. Right. So they, they've done some therapies. We've been, you know, we've moved and things have changed and there's been waiting lists and, you know, you have to jump through all these hoops. But I mean, the, they've steadily been in their uh, early development school and therapies and stuff since, since September. So our, our routines are... I guess it really kind of depends on the season, but they have school Monday through Thursday and they, they have therapies, different types of therapies Monday through Friday. I think mainly what's important with our routine is just kind of our space of of being home, having bedtime that is around seven ish sleeping in our own bed. I think it's really environment when we go out of town and visit our families. That's kind of when, they are deregulated or we've noticed too, when sometimes people come and visit and stay the night, they just get like super excited and they can't sleep at night. And it does sometimes take a while to get back in the routine of things. And, but I can see that with probably any kid. It's yeah, certainly with, uh, with my kids too, but again, it probably, like you had said, pro- probably to much greater degree. Although, Every kid is different. <laughs> yeah, as Sam, you were talking about before we started recording, the boys have school Monday through Thursday, correct? And then therapies, different kinds of therapies in the afternoons every Monday through Thursday, and then therapy all day on Friday. Did I get that right? Yeah, they have a, a pretty structured uh, regimen. Uh, they go to early intervention, really preschool uh, four mornings a week and they're in a class with six or seven other autistic three and four year olds. And, and they really are learning how to be in a classroom. Uh, the hope for these kids is that they're able to, you know, with some help transition into normal classes, normal schools. And so they learn some of those just normal preschool things. They, they sit at little tables, little chairs, and the teacher helps them, you know, kind of draw things and do little arts and crafts projects. They, Send t- they spend time in a circle on the carpet and they sing songs and they read stories. And it's not all that different than a normal preschool class, except there's, there, there are more adults in the room. You know, they get a little bit more, a little more help. And they also do what's called ABA therapy, which stands for applied behavioral analysis. And a lot of that has to do with kind of compliance, you know, yes and no. And they work on potty training a little bit and, and it's pretty standard autism therapy. 
Uh, it's a lot of therapy through playing, you know, through activities. And, and that's good too. And, and a couple afternoons a week, they do uh, one-on-one occupational therapy and speech therapy. And that's where they work on things like eating with a utensil and, and they, they play little like matching games. They identify objects that are very common in their life. So this is an apple, you know, this is a doggy. This is, you know, the, 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 that's where they really try to teach them to, to say some of those, some of those words. And so they might have pictures of mom and dad and they work on mom, and dad and, and brother and, and stuff like that. So they have a pretty intense schedule. They, they go to autism therapy, they go to speech and occupational therapy and they go to preschool. So, uh, the routine is good for them and and they really enjoy it a lot. They really thrive in that routine. So they love being busy like that. They do. And and living up here in Northern Minnesota during the, uh, during the winters, if they, if they can't go do that, if it's, if it's a snow day, if. You know, they, they kind of bounce off the walls. They, they are in constant motion and, and they love to be stimulated, you know, by, by songs, by books, uh, by, by play. And so, uh, yeah, wear them out. That's a, that's a pretty good strategy. Uh, let them run around. Acro- across the boards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's true for me, any, any toddler, but, but especially them. Hmm. What do your Sundays look like? Oh, of course you're, you're pastor but in terms of congregational life with your children how do they support you and olivia and the pews and to to be honest stephanie i feel like i have an easier job on sunday morning than my wife you know (laughs) i stand up there and i preach and you know i it's it's actually kind of the one time of the week where i can't be i can't be handed a child right so my sister was gracious enough to move up here when we moved up and, and oh, Olivia wow. and my sister, they, they man a pew kind of off to the side and they make sure they bring lots of activities, stickers, you know, books that don't make a lot of noise. And, and they just sort of contain, they contain the children during the service. Olivia was kind of funny a couple weeks ago, the boys were being particularly tough and she was sending me sort of you know, telepathic messages that I need to wrap up my sermon because <laughs> <laughs> the kids weren't going to make it through the whole service. And so, you know, it's, it's good to have some help from time to time. We'll have people in the congregation, you know, hold the kids so they can go up the communion line and, and stuff like that. But it, it is a, it is sort of a, uh, it's a logistical effort. Uh, Olivia is always looking for new activities and things to occupy them during the, uh, the church service. I mean, every, every little kid is pretty squirmy as, as you know, during, during church, but they, they do. Okay. You know, we talked about routine. It's part of the routine. They're in church every week. And, and so I admire Olivia a lot for, for doing her best to, to handle that stress because it is stressful. Yeah. And we hear in the background, sweet little Peter who got to accompany us because he was hungry and he needed his mama. And so we now have a third guest along and it's great <laughs> that's good media right yeah yeah <laughs> what do you sam and olivia want the church at large to know and how how do you feel you know sharing what you've shared today would help the church come in support of families who care for children with special needs it is interesting you know because i am a pastor i I tend to think about a lot of things theologically as well. And, uh, you know, you start to think, and I'm pretty sure this is a pretty big theme of, of a lot of your podcasts. A lot of your guests sort of echo this sentiment is we have a tendency as a, as a world to value people based on their competency, you know, their sort of a utilitarian view. What can they do for us? You know, and so we can view a lot of groups of people as maybe a burden as less valuable you can think about well obviously you probably you know you talk about a lot of life issues here but sort of the the big one that we think about is the the pregnancies and the and the babies in utero what value do they have what intrinsic value do they have and probably talk about mercy efforts and you know maybe people who are down on their luck or people who are struggling and and what value do they have and and we can turn to the scriptures and, and it's, it's very clear 
what Christ expects for us in dealing with the least of our brothers, right? Now, what does it mean to be the least of these brothers? Well, probably means a lot of things. But what we have to remember at all times, to get to your question, what the church needs to remember is that God created all of us. And he's the one that endows us with with value. It's not our competency. It's not our it's not our intellect. It's not any of those things. It's the fact that God made us. And I feel like my twin boys, Leland and Frederick, are fearfully and wonderfully made. They they love and we love them. And besides all the gifts that they might have, and I think they are very smart, and I think they will have some contributions to make to the world. But even beyond that, I know that they have a God who made them and and loves them. And so when we think about our special needs folks and our congregations and our communities, we need to be very careful about how we regard them. We want to regard them as Christ regards them and not as less than, not as burdens. After the initial shock of an autism diagnosis wears away, like Olivia said, these are your children. And these are the children that God gave you. This might sound a little bit selfish, but I think there's some truth to it is my children have made me a better person. They've taught me to love more unconditionally as God loves us. You can think about it in the terms of vocation, because I think a lot of people might ask the question, why? Why me? Well, maybe there's very good reason. Maybe this is what God has entrusted to you. And it's, it's an honor. And so I, I think I want the church to know, view, view people, all people, the way that God views them and sort of dispense of the world's way of valuing people. I think that would be the big thing for me. Beautifully put. It's like you're a pastor or something. <laughs> <laughs> One final question out of personal curiosity. And as we're raising our own children, how do you, even at three, teach your boys about their identity being wrapped up in Christ? And how do you think that will carry on as they get older? That's a great question, Stephanie, that I don't quite have the answer to. And I think about it a lot. As a pastor, I mentioned this earlier, you know, I had these visions of having children and be able to teach them things, how to throw a baseball, how to drive a car, and most importantly, teach them about their savior, Jesus Christ. And at this point where my boys are, that's a hard thing to do, to, to teach them anything. It's just kind of where they are in their development right now. You can do some things. You can bring them to church. Never discount the power of that. You can bring them to the waters of holy baptism, <laughs> obviously. But to kind of get more to the heart of your question, I'm hoping that as they, as they grow and their communication skills improve, that they'll be able to really trust in their Lord. And, and believe that Jesus loves them and died for them. It's honestly something that's very much on my heart and mind. You know, I'm, I'm not the kind of pastor who would ever seek a, an advanced degree or, or write books. I don't have much wisdom, but that is something I would really like to look into, sort of a, a Christian perspective on, you know, developmental disabilities. Uh, there's a lot of churches. Our church here in Moorhead, Minnesota, actually has a special education Sunday school for adults. It's really a beautiful thing. They come to church almost every week and they have they have helpers who who come with them. And the, even though they're in their 30s and 40s, they kind of have sort of simple Sunday school lessons. I take a lot of solace in the fact that when Christ talks about the kind of faith that he desires us to have, you know, he doesn't talk about the faith of the the pastor, or the theologian or the seminary professor. He talks about faith like a child. Uh, when I'm able to achieve a certain certain level of communication with, with the twins, we, we want to make sure they know as of first importance who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. But it is tough. It's, it is something I think about a lot. I think it's something that every parent should think about and is important. And I pray too with you, Sam, for wisdom on how to help them embrace that and know that as they grow. So... God be with us as we as we do that really important task. And always, I'm always comforted by the fact that we can speak God's word to people, but ultimately, faith is is the work of the Holy Spirit. And and God has made made a lot of promises to to my child as He has all of those that have been baptized that 
the Holy Spirit is, has been given to them and we have to just trust God. Mm-hmm. We do what we can in, in speaking those words and raising our children in the faith, but a lot of trust goes along with that. Really, God's gift to us too as embodied preachers is that he's given us his means by which faith can cling and be reassured through the physical word and the audible hearing of preaching and teaching and and the the very physical elements of baptism water and then of course when they're you know able to come up to the communion rail and receive Christ's gifts that way through body and blood bread and wine that is an assurance that is such a gift to all of God's people. Absolutely. And and there's something we're reminded of constantly and it's actually kind of uh kind of sobering for Olivia and I is that the boys are taking in more than we realize they're oh, yeah. taking in. They are learning and they are listening and they are repeating mm-hmm. <laughs> what we say. Yes. And and they're probably getting more out of church and children's messages and Jesus loves me and than we even realize. I'm pretty sure about that. And I, you've had a couple of kids with autism come through your confirmation class. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a good it's a good point. Autism is so prevalent. It's like one in 40. And it's not always severe and it's not always diagnosed at a young age like it was for our boys. But you know autistic people. Uh, everyone does. They're in your classroom. They're in your family. And I've had the privilege of of teaching them in confirmation classes, you know, those eighth and ninth graders who are on the spectrum, who who received some therapies when they were young. And they're some of my favorite students. They're really sincere. They're not as distracted by the world as, as some of the other kids. And and they're all they're almost always just sweet kids uh, that I really enjoy working with. Autism is not a tragedy <laughs> by any means. I think by and large, autistic people can be very loving, but they also teach us to love. And, and that's probably one of the greatest values a person can have. I agree. Thank you so much, Sam and Olivia, for joining me today. Well, thanks for having us. It was a lot of fun. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follower subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. 